It's a real pleasure to uh, have uh, Professor uh, David Chan here. He is a professor in the Division of Biology and also an investigator in the Howard Hughes Medical Institute at the California Institute of Technology. He got his uh, MD and PhD in the HST program at Harvard and MIT, and after that did his postdoctoral work at the uh, Whitehead Institute, and then joined uh, the California Institute of uh, Technology back in 2000, where he is uh, assembled through the ranks. He's world uh, known and, and uh, as an expert in both mitochondrial dynamics as well as mitochondrial DNA protection and processing. Uh, it's a field that is expanding. We were just chatting in an enormous way because of its impact in cell biology and in point of fact, much of the work that Professor Chan has done has led to the importance of this organelle in the functioning of the cell. So David, we look forward to your presentation. Um, okay, so. Thank you, Bob. Um, so it's a, I'm really grateful for the invitation to come and speak here. I uh, had a great time meeting with the investigators here at NIH and hearing about their uh, very interesting work. So my lab is interested in the dynamic properties of mitochondria. So first I just want to go through some of the ways in which mitochondria are dynamic. So the first way, and this is the main topic of today's talk, is that mitochondria undergo cycles of fusion and fission. So you can have two mitochondria that come together uh, and fuse so that there's only one mitochondrion. And at the same time, you can have the opposite process where a mitochondrion divides by fission into two smaller uh, organelles. Um, another way in which mitochondria are dynamic is that they're actively transported to specific parts of the cell, and this often occurs along the cytoskeleton. So, for example, you can have anterograde movement uh, away from the cell nucleus and retrograde movement towards the cell nucleus. Uh, and in certain cell types, this helps to distribute the mitochondria in the cell. But in certain specialized cell types, like neurons, this can really uh, localize mitochondria to specific subcellular sites. So for example, in neurons, this type of active transport helps to ensure that mitochondria are uh, well represented at the termini, where they play important roles in ATP production and calcium handling. And a particularly uh, I think dramatic example of this is shown in Jeff Lickman's work from uh, at Harvard where this is a transgenic mouse that expresses a mitochondrially targeted CFP molecule. And this is uh, part of the nerve. You can see individual mitochondria in this part of the nerve. But when the motor neurons uh, terminate at the motor end plate, which is highlighted in red, you can see that the mitochondria are so dense that you can't make out individual organelles. So this is an example of how active transport and retention of mitochondria can serve to localize mitochondria to specific parts of the cell. Another way in which mitochondria are dynamic is that they uh, undergo structural changes during programmed cell death. So, so for example, in apoptosis. So mitochondria are unusual organelles in that they contain two membranes. There's an outer membrane and an inner membrane, and the inner membrane is convoluted uh, into these cristae compartments. And so it's, all, it's been argued that uh, the contents of the cristae membrane, uh, even though they're continuous with the intermembrane space, uh, are not freely diffusible, and you have to open up these cristae junctions in order for these contents to be, uh, uh, to interact with each other. And during the process of apoptosis, in many cases, there's fragmentation of mitochondria, so there's induced mitochondrial fission, uh, which leads to uh, mitochondrial fragmentation. There's opening of the mitochondrial outer membranes, and there's also changes in the cristae junctions so that uh, intermembrane components like cytochrome C can uh, come out, and they play pro-apoptotic roles. And then finally, the, the last dynamic feature of mitochondria that I wanted to point out is that they undergo selective degradation by autophagy. 
And when mitochondria are degraded by autophagy, that's termed mitophagy. And this is work from uh, John LeMaster's group where he shows using, rat, uh, using mouse hepatocytes uh, that you can have damaged mitochondria undergoing degradation. So these red spots here are uh, the mitochondria in these hepatocytes. And a laser is used to inactivate uh, the membrane potential in some of these mitochondria. And those mitochondria are the ones that then associate with an autophagy marker, which is this, red, uh, which is this green marker over here. So mitochondria that become dysfunctional and lose membrane potential can be selectively recognized and degraded. OK, so let me go back and uh, talk about mitochondrial fusion and division. So uh, inherently, this is a somewhat complicated process because, as I mentioned, mitochondria have double membranes. And so during the process of mitochondrial fusion, there has to be coordinated fusion of four lipid bilayers. So two outer membranes and two inner membranes. And the net result of this fusion event is that there's lipid mixing between these two membranes uh, and content mixing so that the contents of the internal membrane space uh, are mixed and the contents of the matrix, which is the internal contents of the mitochondria, are mixed. And this process turns out to be dependent on membrane potential across the inner membrane. Um, and there are many functions of mitochondrial fusion and fission, which I'll talk more about. But one of the functions is that it controls the morphology of mitochondria. So the balance between fusion and fission controls mitochondrial shape, size, and number. OK, so the molecules that are involved in mitochondrial fusion turn out to be large GTPases. And there are three of them in mammals. So our work has focused on mammalian cells. And these are some groups that uh, uh, work on similar problems in yeast cells. So in mammals, there are uh, two sets of large G GTPases. The first two are called mitofusins, so MFN1 and MFN2. These are uh, outer membrane GTPases that have a U-shaped transmembrane domain. Uh, and they are necessary for mitochondrial fusion. So mice that are deficient for MFN1 or MFN2 have fragmented mitochondria. So the green spots over here are fragmented mitochondria in MFN deficient cells in contrast to the tubular mitochondria present in wild type cells. Uh, and so again, this reiterates uh, the fact that when you have reduced mitochondrial fusion, there's still ongoing mitochondrial division, and that leads to mitochondrial fragmentation. So the balance between fusion and fission controls mitochondrial size, shape, and number. Uh, in addition to the mitofusins, which are located on the mitochondrial outer membrane, there's also uh, OPA1, which is a dynamin-related protein localized to the mitochondrial inner membrane. And it turns out that this protein is also essential for mitochondrial fusion. So cells that lack OPA1 have no detectable mitochondrial fusion. And uh, by using mouse knockouts and then generating cell lines from those mouse knockouts, we can, we can look at the selective roles of mitofusins versus OPA1 in mitochondrial fusion. And it turns out that they have somewhat different phenotypes. So both mitofusin deficient cells and OPA1 deficient cells are deficient for uh, full mitochondrial fusion. But if you look more specifically at outer membrane fusion versus inner membrane fusion, they have a difference. So mitofusins, which are located on the mitochondrial outer membrane, are defective for outer membrane fusion. They don't undergo even the first steps of mitochondrial fusion. Whereas in OPA1 deficient cells, uh, those cells will undergo outer membrane fusion, but they get trapped at this intermediate stage. And so they're unable to undergo inner membrane fusion. So we currently view mitochondrial fusion as a multi-step process where outer membrane fusion occurs first. This depends on mitofusins that are located on the mitochondrial outer membrane. And that's followed by inner membrane fusion, which is dependent on OPA1, which is either um, there's an isoform that's associated with the inner membrane and another isoform, other isoforms that are in the intermembrane space. So I mentioned that uh, mitochondrial fusion can control uh, mitochondrial morphology. So an example is shown here. 
So in a normal fibroblast, you have uh, normal rates of mitochondrial fusion and fission. So here's a fibroblast. The blank area here is the nucleus. And you can see it has tubular mitochondria. If you knock out proteins involved in uh, mitochondrial fusion, like MFNs, there's lower levels of mitochondrial fusion, which leads to mitochondrial fragmentation. You can also do the opposite experiment and block mitochondrial fission in these cells. And in that case, uh, you get cells that have overly long and interconnected mitochondria. You can also simultaneously block mitochondrial fusion and fission. And when you do that, you can restore mitochondrial tubules to uh, the cells that have fragmented mitochondria. So this is an example of how you can manipulate the morphology of mitochondria by manipulating the balance between fusion and fission. Now, one of the reasons that we're interested in these processes is that human genetic studies indicate that these processes are clearly important for human health. So the first disease that illustrates th this is uh, dominant optic atrophy, which is uh, the most commonly inherited optic neuropathy, and it's caused by heterozygous mutations in OPA1. So in this disease, uh, there's degeneration of the retinal ganglion cells, uh, which have cell bodies that are located in the retina, and their processes are bundled into the optic nerve. And so this is a blindness that's caused by a defect in the mitochondrial fusion gene. There's a second disease uh, called Charcot-Marie tooth type 2A, which is caused by, again, heterozygous mutations in MFN2. So most, so there are many forms of CMT. Uh, the major forms are actually demyelinating diseases. They're uh, a defect in the Schwann cell. But in type 2A, uh, this is actually an exonopathy where the neuron itself is defective. Um, and th I think this is a quite interesting disease because this affects motor and sensory neurons uh, that, uh, whose cell bodies are located near the spinal cord, but then they enervate uh, the extremities. And so in this disease, uh, patients have weak hands and feet and also sensory loss. And so in this disease where there's a defect in the mitochondrial fusion gene, it's only the longest peripheral neurons that are affected and the more, uh, the more proximal neurons are spared. So to look at some of these issues about why mitochondrial fusion seems to be particularly important for neurons, we've been uh, studying mouse that have knockouts in MFN1 or MFN2. And uh, mutations in either one of those genes will lead to embryonic lethality. But we've also made conditional knockouts that allow us to look more selectively at the, the post-embryonic roles of these genes. And so in the case of MFN2 knockouts, we found that if we bypass the placental defect, those mice have a very severe ataxia. And that ataxia is associated with a cerebellar defect. So this is an example here. So in wild type, uh, animals. This is the cerebellum seven days after birth. Um, it looks relatively normal in a MFN2 mutant, but the cerebellum is underdeveloped. But if you look at animals that are just one week later, uh, in wild type animals, there is uh, extensive cell migration and differentiation that occurs uh, in the cerebellum at this time. But in an MFN2 knockout, there's atrophy of uh, this part of the brain. And it turns out that there is a specific neuron that's uh, defective. So this is just a histological slide where you can consider this to be the outside of the cerebellum. And this is called the molecular layer. And this is the internal granular layer. Uh, the granule cells are the most abundant neurons in the cerebellum. And uh, at the interface of these two layers is a, a cell type called the Purkinje cell. And it turns out that that's the neuron that is defective in these animals. So if we look using a marker for Purkinje cells, uh, this is how these cells develop in the first two weeks of life. So six days after birth, there's a layer of Purkinje cells here uh, in this part of the cerebellum. And over time, these cells will extend out uh, their dendritic processes into the molecular layer so that by day 15, you can see how extensive that dendritic layer is. But in, in animals that lack MFN2, 
uh, they start off with a, a, a layer of Purkinje cells, but by 10 days of, after birth, you can see that there's a pretty severe defect. So they have uh, Purkinje cells, but their dendrites are much shorter, and they have reduced uh, dendritic spines. And these cells will die over the next week, so that at two weeks after birth, there's very few Purkinje cells in the cerebellum, and this is what leads to the ataxia. So in studying what the defects are in these cells that lack mitochondrial fusion, it turns out that they have a very severe respiratory defect. And the basis for that, uh, in part, is that they have a defect in maintenance of mitochondrial DNA. So uh, here we're returning back again to fibroblasts, and in fibroblasts, in wild-type cells, uh, the green here shows uh, the mitochondria, and the red is a nuclear uh, stain. And so you can see that these mitochondria contain these compact DNA-containing structures called nucleoids. So these are the genomes of uh, the mitochondria. And every mitochondrial tubule has at least one empty DNA nucleoid because uh, the mitochondrial genome encodes for essential components of the respiratory chain. In cells that lack mitochondrial fusion, you can see that the mitochondria are fragmented. Uh, they do retain mitochondrial DNA, but you can see that a large population of the mitochondria uh, lack mtDNA nucleoids. And so these mitochondria uh, are, would be respiratory deficient. And so uh, our model for what the function of mitochondrial fusion is, is that it allows content exchange between mitochondria, and this content exchange is important to maintain uh, the function of the mitochondrial population. So we think that in wild-type cells, there's a population of mitochondria that continuously interacts and exchanges content with each other. Uh, and you can imagine that you can have individual mitochondria that sporadically develop a defect. And there can be many reasons for this. One reason would be that there's a division event in which a mitochondrion fails to inherit uh, a mitochondrial DNA nucleoid. But those defects uh, can be repaired because that mitochondrion can fuse with a neighboring mitochondrion, uh, and then a subsequent fusion event leads to complementation of that defect. And in cells that lack mitochondrial uh, fusion, once these defects occur, they, uh, remain, they're prolonged or permanent. So in our uh, system, where we look at the defects that arise due to a defect in mitochondrial fusion, we always see the protective effects of mitochondrial fusion. I should also point out that there is also uh, a complementary view that when uh, defects are very severe, it might be beneficial to uh, restrict the fusion of those mitochondria so that they can be segregated and degraded by autophagy. And so for, for example, Orion Shirahai has shown that when uh, mitochondria lose, uh, completely lose membrane potential, uh, they no longer can fuse with neighboring mitochondria, and those mitochondria then become segregated and perhaps are degraded by autophagy. So it could be that depending on the severity of mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, either those mitochondria can be repaired by content mixing, or perhaps they're segregated when the defect is too severe and then degraded. Okay, so in the next part of my talk, I would like to just summarize some of our studies on the function of mitochondrial fusion in skeletal muscle. So we were interested in skeletal muscle because obviously uh, mitochondria are very important in that cell type. And depending on the type of skeletal muscle, uh, for example, whether it's a uh, glycolytic or oxidative muscle fiber type, the mitochondria have, have uh, different uh, degrees of abundance, but in general, they're highly, uh, they're, they're positioned very precisely in the cell. So here you can see, for example, that uh, there are pairs of mitochondria that are positioned on the two sides of the Z disk uh, in this sarcomere. And so because the mitochondria and skeletal muscle are so precisely uh, positioned, in contrast to uh, the case in fibroblasts where we can see mitochondria move around the cell uh, continuously, we thought it would be good to ask whether mitochondrial fusion is important in this cell type. And so we knocked out uh, mitofusins in skeletal muscle using the MLC-CRE 
uh, driver system that was developed by Steve Burden. And what we found is that these mice have uh, very severe defects. Uh, so this is a muscle-specific deletion of uh, both mitofusins. They have low body weight, low body temperature, low blood glucose, and high serum lactate that gets worse with exercise. So they have characteristics that are um, suggestive of a mitochondrial defect. And when you look at the muscles from these uh, animals, uh, the muscles are deeper red, which might suggest that there is more, uh, there's a, a higher level of mitochondrial abundance. And that uh, turns out to be the case, which I'll show you in a second. So we did some histological studies of the muscle from these animals. Uh, so in wild type muscles, uh, using staining for complex two and complex four, where the complex four staining is this brown stain, you can see that in wild type animals, uh, transverse sections of the muscle first show a homogeneously staining uh, muscle section that over the first two months of life differentiates into this checkerboard appearance. So here is a muscle fiber that is, uh, has high mitochondrial function, and here's a muscle fiber that has low uh, mitochondrial function. But when we look at animals that lack the mitofusins in skeletal muscle, we see, first of all, that they have smaller diameters for their muscle fibers, and they have, uh, this, more, they have this intense blue stain, which is an increase in complex two. So in this type of staining, an increase in complex two often indicates a mitochondrial dysfunction uh, uh, because of a defect in mitochondrial DNA. So I'll explain that in a second. But, but, the, but these animals develop respiratory deficiency in the muscle fibers. So we uh, collaborated with Mike McCaffrey at Johns Hopkins to do some EM on these uh, muscles. And what we find is that in skeletal muscle, you have this classic appearance in wild-type cells uh, where there are pairs of mitochondria, as I mentioned, that flank the Z-disc. Um, but in contrast, in animals that lack mitofusins, you have this overabundance of mitochondria, uh, and they proliferate and fill the space between myofibrils. And in addition, when you look uh, at the uh, ultrastructure of these mitochondria, you can see that they're swollen and they lack the internal structure that uh, the wild-type mitochondria have. So there's a defect in the structure and the abundance of the interfibular mitochondria uh, in these skeletal muscle cells. There's another place uh, in skeletal muscle where mitochondria are abundant, and that's right under the plasma membrane. So these are the subsarcolemmal mitochondria. And so in normal muscle cells, there's an accumulation of mitochondria there. But in uh, muscle that lacks mitofusins, you can see, again, there's a proliferation of the mitochondria. And again, they have uh, heterogeneity and swelling um, and also a loss of uh, internal structure. So, so these animals have some of the classic phenotypes of a mitochondrial dysfunction. They have high serum lactate. Uh, there's muscle atrophy, there's a defect in the electron transport chain, and mitochondrial proliferation. And so these kinds of problems actually resemble the problems that you see in human diseases that are caused by defects in mitochondrial DNA. So there's a class of human diseases called uh, encephalomyopathies, which are maternally inherited and are due to uh, maternally inherited mutations in the mitochondrial genome. So this is the circular mitochondrial genome. It's only 16 kilobases in length. Uh, and these are the locations of various mutations that give rise to clinical uh, syndromes. And so we wanted to ask, in this uh, skeletal muscle system where we don't have mitofusins and have a mitochondrial defect that resembles encephalomyopathies, um, is there a defect in the mitochondrial genome? So we used uh, quantitative PCR to look at the levels of mtDNA uh, in the mitochondria. And so if you look at wild-type uh, animals, this is the level of mitochondrial DNA uh, compared to nuclear DNA. And in animals that lack both mitofusins, there's a severe depletion of mitochondrial DNA. So there's only 7% of the mitochondrial DNA compared to wild-type animals. And this defect 
is dependent on losing both mitofusins. So if you lose just MFN1 or MFN2, that defect doesn't occur. And the reason that this severe defect uh, develops is that there's a problem in proliferation of mtDNA uh, during the first two months of life. So this is the phenotype at seven weeks of age. If we track uh, the levels of mtDNA uh, during development, uh, what we find in wild type animals is that uh, the levels increase greatly in the first two months of life. Uh, and this is associated with the differentiation of the muscle fibers as I showed you in the, one of the previous slides. But in uh, animals that lack uh, MFN1 and MFN2, you can see that uh, they have reduced levels even as early as one week of age, and that level doesn't increase uh, as you see in wild type animals. And so uh, at seven weeks of age, you have this very severe uh, defect. Okay, so let me uh, summarize this part of the talk. So uh, we, were, we, we asked whether mitochondrial dynamics is important for mtDNA stability, and we found that uh, in the case of skeletal muscle, is important for maintenance of mtDNA levels. And I didn't sh uh, show you this, but there's actually a defect in the fidelity of the mtDNA. So in the absence of mitofusins, there's actually an increase in point mutations and, and deletions. And so we think that uh, mitochondrial fusion probably plays a protective role in pathologies that involve mtDNA. Uh, there's also an association with mitochondrial fusion and the ability to tolerate mtDNA mutations, but uh, I'm not showing the data for that today. Okay, so, so what these types of studies um, and also human genetic studies have shown is that mitochondrial fusion and fission are important for a wide range of tissues uh, in mammals. So for example, for mitochondrial fusion, from the human diseases, we know that uh, uh, OPA1 is important in uh, the retinal ganglion cells in the eye. Uh, MFN2 is important in the peripheral nerves. From the mouse knockouts, we know that uh, MFN2 uh, is important in the, uh, the cerebellum, and both mitofusins are important in skeletal muscle. There's also been work uh, from other labs, so from uh, um, um, Hiromi Saseki's lab and uh, Mahara's lab, showing that uh, mice that lack mitochondrial fission also have uh, neuronal degeneration. And there's also one human case in which a defect in mitochondrial fission results in perinatal lethality. So there's a lot of evidence that fusion and fission are important for a variety of cell types uh, in mammals. And so because of this, uh, we decided it would be important to be able to better uh, study mitochondrial dynamics in tissues. So most studies of mitochondrial dynamics rely on culture uh, cell lines because it's much easier to image mitochondrial dynamics at high resolution uh, in, the, in those cases. Uh, but mouse knockout studies and also human genetic studies indicate that mitochondrial dynamics is important in tissues. And so we think that it's important to develop systems to monitor mitochondrial dynamics uh, in intact tissues. And so the way that we did this is to uh, try to develop some mouse models where we can image mitochondria uh, more effectively. And so this was uh, work that was done by Ann Pham, who uh, was an MD-PhD student uh, in my lab. And so what she did was to develop, um, uh, uh, to target a fluorophore to mitochondria that, was, that is photoactivatable. So we targeted uh, the fluorophore dendra 2 to the mitochondria, uh, and we knocked in this construct into the ubiquitously expressed Rosa 26 locus, and we made two versions of this mouse. In one version, uh, this construct is uh, ubiquitously expressed, and basically in this mouse, uh, essentially all the cells in the body contain flu fluorescently labeled uh, mitochondria. In a second version, uh, the construct has a stop sequence in front of it that's flanked by LOX P sites. And so uh, in order for this construct to be active, it has to, you have to add Cre recombinase. And so we can conditionally activate uh, this uh, mitochondrial fluorophore 
selectively at different developmental stages or in different uh, tissues. And I should point out that one of the features of Dendra 2 is that it's photoconvertible. So this floor 4 is normally green, but if you activate it using a laser, you can turn its fluorescence to red. And this system works pretty well. So here we have uh, the conditional uh, system that I mentioned. So when we isolate fibroblasts from those mice, those fibroblasts don't have fluorescent mitochondria, but then we can transduce those cells with uh, a retrovirus that contains Cre, and now the mitochondria in those cells uh, are fluorescently labeled. So here we can see the different mitochondrial morphologies in this cell. So there's uh, a punctate mitochondria in here, a short tubule, long tubules, and uh, interconnected tubules. And then we can do photoactivation studies to look at uh, the fusion of mitochondria. So here, uh, when I run this movie, you'll see photoactivation. So here, uh, several, several regions of mitochondria are photoactivated. If you look over here, there's a fusion event that leads to content mixing. And there'll be another event here, followed by a third event over here. So, so these, uh, this marker is located in the matrix of the mitochondria. And so when you get content exchange, that means that there's outer membrane and inner membrane fusion that's occurring. OK. so. When we look at the various tissues, so when we look at the, the ubiquitously expressed form of this mouse, uh, we can find that there's expression of this uh, fluorophore in many tissues. So many types of neurons uh, in the myocardium, hepatocytes, uh, and in kidney cells. So these are just uh, frozen sections where we can quickly get a sense of mitochondrial morphology in the tissues. We can also look in live cells. Some of the live cells that we've looked at are uh, sperm. So this is the sperm head, the tail. And you can see that the mid piece of uh, the sperm is where the mitochondrial dendra uh, is. And we can photoactivate part of that. Uh, this is from a live uh, skeletal muscle fiber. Uh, and again, here are the pairs of mitochondria. The Z disk is right here. Uh, and then we can also. Uh, isolate uh, cardiomyocytes, and we also see that the mitochondria are fluorescent. And so by using this system, we can uh, look at uh, mitochondrial dynamics. Uh, so here's an example. This is a skeletal muscle. Uh, and so we can photoactivate a subset of mitochondria. And then if we track the fluorescence uh, in a movie, you can see that uh, there can be so in this, so this is a longitudinal section of uh, the muscle fiber. So the muscle fiber is running in this direction. Uh, you can see that there are fusion events that can occur uh, in this direction as well as in this, in this direction. And so we can use this to study mitochondrial dynamics in skeletal muscle. We can also um, use this system to better uh, understand the changes in mitochondrial shape that occur in uh, mouse knockouts. So remember I told you earlier that if we knock out MFN2, we get a defect in Purkinje cells. So an example of that is shown here. Um, if we knock out MFN2 in uh, adult Purkinje cells, uh, we, can allow, uh, we can allow the Purkinje cells to develop. So this is a calbindin stain where this is the cell body of the Purkinje cell and these are the dendrites. Uh, and at three months of age, uh, you can see that most of the Purkinje cells are gone. So we can look at this uh, system using this uh, uh, mitodendra mouse. Uh, and you can see that uh, in wild type sections, uh, so here are the Purkinje cells. These are uh, the mitochondria in the Purkinje cells. And when we knock out MFN2, you can see that there's much more sparse mitochondria. Uh, and, th and that's particularly uh, evident in the dendritic processes. And, and in, this, uh, in these slides here, we're again using frozen sections just to get a quick sense of the mitochondrial morphology. But we can get much higher resolution if we use organotypic slices. So this is uh, a technique where we 
uh, simply take a slice of uh, the brain and then culture those slices um, in tissue culture. And uh, this allows these slices to survive for uh, several months and it preserves the interconnections be between some of the neurons. And so we can visualize uh, mitochondrial dynamics using confocal microscopy. And we can also uh, make perturbations. And when we do that, we get uh, much better imaging of these cells. So this, in this top panel, the, these are the uh, Purkinje cells again. So these, these are the Purkinje cells because they're calbinin positive. So these, these are two Purkinje cells, the cell body, the dendritic arbor. Uh, and here we can see uh, the mitochondrial staining. Uh, and you can see how densely packed the mitochondria are uh, in these dendritic processes. In a different part of the organic typic slice, we can see uh, neurons in the midbrain. And these are uh, uh, dopaminergic neurons uh, that are present in the substantia nigra. And again, we can visualize the mitochondria in those cells. So um, we can use the system to look at uh, different types of neurons in the brain. OK, so in the last part of my talk, I, I'll talk about using the system to uh, look at uh, what happens uh, to dopaminergic neurons when they lose uh, my MFN2. OK, so as I'm sure you all know, uh, since Richard Yule is here, uh, Parkinson's disease has an association with uh, mitochondrial function. So Parkinson's disease is the second most common neurodegenerative disease. It's a movement defect. And for uh, decades, there's been a link between uh, mitochondrial function and Parkinson's disease. And this is because mitochondrial toxins like MPTP or rotenone uh, can cause Parkinsonian symptoms in mammals and in humans. Uh, so this has been known for a long time. But more recently, uh, there's been uh, even more direct evidence that mitochondrial function is involved in Parkinson's disease. And that is because 10% uh, of Parkinson's disease is familial. And uh, there's been a number of genes that have been identified to be linked to Parkinson's disease. And two of them are Parkin and PINK1. And it turns out that these two genes uh, work in a common pathway uh, to preserve mitochondrial function. And Richard Yule has shown that PINK1 and Parkin are involved in the elimination of dysfunctional mitochondria. So when mitochondria become dysfunctional, it's been shown that uh, Parkin translocates to those mitochondria, and that system can result in the degradation of those dysfunctional mitochondria. Um, and so we, we uh, did one study where we looked at some of the changes that occur uh, in this type of degradation. So when mitochondria become dysfunctional in this system, Parkin is recruited onto those dysfunctional mitochondria that have lost membrane potential. Uh, and Parkin is an E3 ubiquitin ligase. It leads to ubiquitination of many proteins on the mitochondrial outer membrane. And that secondarily leads to activation of the ubiquitin proteasome system, which causes degradation of many proteins on the mitochondrial outer membrane. And somehow that event is necessary for the degradation of those dysfunctional mitochondria by mitophagy. So, so in Parkinson's disease, there are uh, genes that are associated with the disease that seem to affect mitochondrial dynamics. And in addition, uh, it's also been shown in some elegant fly studies that if you perturb mitochondrial dynamics, you can actually perturb the phenotype of a pink one or a Parkin knockout. Uh, so there's been uh, a number of fly labs that have shown this. I'm highlighting work from uh, Ming Guo's lab. So here uh, we have uh, in flies a pink one knockout. It leads to uh, apoptosis in uh, these cells. But if you then uh, knock down the fly mitofusin, you can suppress that defect. Or if you overexpress DRP1, which is involved in mitochondrial fission, you can also suppress that defect. 
So this is a complicated phenotype to understand, but the main point that I want to make is that you can modify the phenotype of a pink one or a Parkin knockout by manipulating mitochondrial dynamics. So just to uh, summarize the argument, uh, there are Parkinson's disease-associated mutations and genes that have a link to mitochondrial dynamics. So for example, cells that lack pink one or Parkin can have mitochondrial morphology defects. In addition, the effect of Parkinson's associated mutations can be greatly modulated by mitochondrial dynamics. So if you increase uh, fusion or increase fission, you can modify uh, those effects. And so because of that, we decided to ask, uh, what's the role of mitochondrial dynamics in dopaminergic neurons and particularly in the substantia nigra because that's relevant for Parkinson's disease. So the way that we did this was to, again, use our conditional MFN2 knockout animals and to uh, use a mating scheme where we used the dopamine transporter to knock out MFN1 or MFN2 in the dopaminergic neurons. And we also incorporated uh, this uh, mouse that allows us to track the mitochondria. And what we found uh, is that if we knock out MFN1 in these dopaminergic neurons, we don't get any phenotype at all. But if we knock out MFN2, we get animals that are uh, runted. Uh, so this is shown here. So here's uh, the trace for uh, uh, wild-type animals, uh, just the weight gain over time. And you can see that. Uh, if the animals lack MFN2, there's a pretty severe uh, decrease in weight gain. Uh, and it turns out that uh, there is a pretty severe movement defect in these animals. Uh, oh, I should point out that these animals, if you just uh, keep them in normal cages, uh, they'll die at six weeks of age uh, due to lack of feeding. But if you put uh, food and water at the bottom of the cage, they'll live for over a year. And so that allowed us to look at the long-term phenotypes of these mice. Uh, and this is an open field test where a mouse is placed into an open field and then you simply track their movement uh, in that space. And so, this, so these lines indicate the movement of the mice. And you can see that MFN2 deficient animals have a movement defect that's detectable as early as four weeks of age, and it gets progressively worse. Um, and for example, if you simply calculate or uh, measure the distance travel, uh, the distance that, they, that these mutant animals travel uh, is reduced at four weeks of age, and it, uh, it seems to plateau out at eight to 11 weeks of age. Okay, um, and there are similar results when we look at how fast these animals move, also their rearing and the time that they stay immobile. So obviously because we're knocking out MFN2 in uh, the, dop the dopaminergic system, we want to look at the consequences for the neurons in this system. And so the first thing that we looked at was to look at the distal projections of these uh, neurons. So the dop so there are dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra. They project to uh, the striatum. Uh, and so we can look at those terminals at the striatum by staining for tyrosine hydroxylase. So uh, this is the striatum over here. And we're simply staining at, uh, for TH. And that tells us the abundance of the terminals uh, at the striatum. And what you can see is that as early as three weeks of age, there is reduced staining in the striatum, uh, suggesting that there's a defect in the nerve terminals uh, in this part of the dopaminergic system. And when you go out to 11 weeks, it, the staining is almost all gone. Um, and this can be quantified. But then if we work backwards uh, in the circuit and we look at the cell bodies, uh, we find that at three weeks of age, uh, when we look at the substantia nigra uh, and we look uh, for TH staining, the cell bodies are actually still present. So there's a, a distal defect in these neurons, 
but when we look at the cell bodies, they're normal. But uh, when we look at 11 weeks, you can see that there's a defect um, that uh, is even worse at 14 weeks. So, so this uh, is a quantification of that result. So in contrast to looking at the nerve terminals, when we look at the cell bodies, at three weeks they're normal, even as far out as eight to nine weeks they're normal, and it's only at, 11, uh, at uh, 10 to 12 weeks uh, do we see this defect in the uh, cell bodies. So what we think happens is that there is a retrograde defect that first starts out at the nerve terminal and then eventually the entire cell degenerates. And this, uh, as you might as expect, because it, ha it deals with MFN2, uh, happens to uh, involve a mitochondrial defect. So using the organotypic slice cultures uh, that I uh, mentioned uh, in conjunction with the mitodendra mouse, we can see that um, uh, when, whether you look at proximal processes or distal processes of those dopaminergic neurons, the knockout mice have greatly reduced uh, numbers of mitochondria. And there's also a pretty severe defect in the transport of mitochondria uh, in, uh, in these neurons. So here's a control uh, neuron where we're looking at a dendrite uh, in one of these dopaminergic neurons in, or, in an organotypic slice culture. And here we photoactivate uh, a cluster of mitochondria. And then we track these photoactivated mitochondria over time. Uh, and so this is a chemo, chemograph where uh, time is in this direction. And so these vertical, uh, so these diagonal lines over here indicate movement of mitochondria from this cluster as they travel along uh, uh, this process. And in contrast, when we look at MFN2 knockout uh, neurons, uh, here we photoactivate a cluster of mitochondria. You can see that there are very few uh, transport events that come out of this cluster. And so we can quantify this, and uh, there's a defect in both the number of transport events as well as the velocity of these transport events. And so we think that uh, there's a transport defect in these mice which leads to this uh, retrograde defect in the neurons. Okay, so uh, we, so let me just summarize this last part of the talk. So we um, have been developing mouse models to study mitochondrial dynamics, and we've uh, used it to study dynamics in dopaminergic neurons. Um, and loss of MFN2 dopaminergic neurons leads to a movement defect, and this movement defect is uh, associated with degeneration in the nigrostriatal circuit in a retrograde manner. So we see loss of terminals at the striatum, uh, and this occurs one to two months before we see loss of cell bodies in the sub substantia nigra. So we think that this mouse model might be a good model to look at uh, the cell biological defects that occur in this type of degeneration. So let me thank the people who uh, did this work. So uh, the, the work with the mouse model to look at uh, mitochondrial dynamics, as well as the work on uh, the dopaminergic neurons, was done by Ann Pham, who's uh, an MD PhD student in the lab. And the earlier studies I talked about, looking at skeletal muscle and cerebellar uh, uh, defects, was done by Shutsen Chen, who is a senior scientist in the lab. Uh, the work that I mentioned briefly on uh, degradation of mitochondrial outer membrane proteins. Uh, in Parkin-mediated mitophagy was done by Nikki Chan, who's a postdoctoral fellow in the lab. Um, and some of the work on uh, uh, the dopaminergic neurons was done in, uh, with help from Andrew Steele, who's a broad uh, senior research fellow at Caltech. And our EM work has been done uh, from a long-term collaboration with Michael McCaffrey, who's at Johns Hopkins. Thank you very much. Okay. We, we have plenty of time for questions, so please come up to the microphones if, if you have some. The, the uh, transgenic mouse with the reporter protein was really interesting. The, the picture you showed in the skeletal muscle, was that in vivo or was that a muscle uh, oh. removed from the animal and looked at in vitro? Because that was an awfully high resolution picture. That, that is a muscle that is removed. Uh, so either 
So we can do it both ways. One is to have the entire muscle and to image it. Uh, and the other way is to tease out muscle fibers. But sure. uh, in both cases, it's not in the intact animal. So in the muscle, then we'll get to in the muscle, you saw what looked like some red or some yellow areas consistent with fusion. But couldn't that also be diffusion from partially irradiated mitochondria where you have some red dye yes. and some green yes. dye, and what you're looking at is axonal diffusion, like was shown by the UCSF group some time ago, I think. Oh, so, so when we photoactivate, um, depending on the degree of photoactivation, right, you can get all different hues. Um, and so, for example, a mitochondrial that is partially photoactivated will look yellow. But if we make movies, we can see, we can see connections between the mitochondria and we see transfer. We, we see this kind of stepwise transfer onto another mitochondria. Um, from what you showed, it's pretty clear that if you alter the mitochondrial fission diffusion machinery that you get big changes in the morphology and then the function of the mitochondria. Um, but you also showed that um, in cell culture particularly that fission diffusion events are happening on the seconds time scale, whereas in the skeletal muscle it may be happening on the order of minutes or maybe hours. So I was wondering if you had any insights into what the signal is um, that tells them when to have fission diffusion events. Right. I, I, I agree that the mitochondrial fusion and fission events are much, we see many more of them in the culture cells than we do in the skeletal muscle. Um, we, don't know what, we, we don't know what the signals are. Uh, I mean, there, there have been some interesting uh, findings. For example, mitochondrial fission is regulated by cell cycle. It's also regulated by nutrient status. Um, and there are other type, there's some cellular stresses that in, induce mitochondrial fusion. But I would say in the in normal cells, we, we don't know what they are. It uh, didn't become clear to me why the Parkinson's uh, mice, their, why the dopaminergic neurons die. Is it because you have a reduction in the number of mitochondria? Is it confounded by the fact that they actually still do not have a full nutritional supplement? Or uh, is it mitochondrial DNA mutations that kills the cells? Or what, what, right. what is your current philosophy on this? I mean, I, I don't think there's a clear, I, I don't think there's a clear answer to that. I, so even, even in sporadic Parkinson's disease, there are some studies that indicate that tissues from patients with sporadic Parkinson's disease also have like a complex one reduction. So, you know, I think the simple answer is that maybe uh, those dopaminergic neurons are more sensitive to, a, to a reduced mitochondrial respiration activity. Um, and there are some arguments why uh, those neurons might be. So for example, it's been argued that those neurons are metabolically highly active. Um, so that's, that's one possibility, but I don't think the answer is very clear. So do you see any uh, change in optic nerve degeneration? Rather, do you find any optic nerve degeneration in MFN with mitofusion to mice or any visual behavior defects? Because OPA2 uh, mutations have problems with uh, fusion, right? So inner membrane. So if you have this uh, outer membrane fusion defects, then you may also see some sort of optic neuropathy. Oh, so you, I mean, did you ever look at visual behavior for that um, that matter in this, uh, you know, in these mice, in this MFN2 knockout mice? So you're asking whether there, there's any optic defects? Optic neuropathy yeah, or any yeah. kind of visual behavior so, defects. Did you ever check that? So we, we haven't looked at optic defects. Um, so I would, so we don't know. But I, but I would say that, um, so in, in my talk, I mentioned that there's this dominant optic atrophy with you know, blindness, and then there's CMT2A with peripheral neuropathy. And so when this was first discovered, it seemed like you know, this really disparate, two, two systems that affect mitochondrial fusion but have very different clinical phenotypes. And I think in the classic cases, that really is the case. But as 
people now have identified more and more families. There are, there are families where there's overlap. So for example, there are CMT patients that also have optic atrophy. And at the same time, there are uh, patients with uh, OPA1 mutations that also have peripheral neuropathy. So there is definitely overlap between the two clinical uh, syndromes. So related, why do you believe that the OPA is specific for the eye and the nerves? When you showed, when you disrupted in skeletal muscle, there's a huge skeletal muscle phenotype that develops. Why doesn't that develop yeah, with that a, defect? So I think in these human diseases, there's actually a very subtle defect, right? So these are heterozygous mutations. Um, and for example, you know, when we have knocked in, so we, we have, so MFN2 mutations cause CMT2A. We've knocked in a couple of these alleles into mice, and there's no, there's, there's no defect uh, in mice. So I think it's a very subtle defect, and uh, for whatever reason, these cells are the ones that are most sensitive. And the simple answer is that in humans, it's easier to detect any kind of uh, phenotype, particularly yes. related to vision, because if you can't see, if you have any problem, you go to a doctor. These mice cannot do that. Right, right. <laughs> Last question. You described very nicely about the changes that occur between uh, mitochondrial DNA and the nuclear DNA in the liver. Did you do a similar study for the brain slices, which you could follow probably? Uh, At what time do the level reach the equilibrium between fission and fusion? In no, we, we haven't looked at mitochondrial DNA content in the brain at all. And so some of the toxins have been shown, as you mentioned, rotinone and MPTP. Do they affect the MFN2 or other proteins causing the degeneration? I don't think, I mean, those toxins are primarily act by uh, inhibiting complex one. So I don't think that there's a direct effect on the you know, the mitofusins or OPA1 in that case. So this concept applies nicely about neurodegeneration, but what happens when cell becomes malignant? Uh, any hypothesis regarding glycolytic oxidation and other process? Sorry, you mean the, the relationship of uh, mitochondrial dynamics to malignancy? Yeah, yeah. yes. Um, I, I, there's really not much information on that. I think there's one study that found that in a type of lung cancer, there was um, an increase in mitochondrial fission. Uh, as far as I know, that's probably the only study uh, relevant to that. But you'd kind of predict if the mitochondrial fission fusion system was messed up, that would be difficult for a cancer cell to proliferate very rapidly. Uh, I would. Maybe not. Yeah, I, I would. <laughs> yeah, that, <Next. laughs> Hi. So, in the recent days, I mean, uh, DNA d damage and uh, like DNA repair proteins mutations uh, leads to ataxia type phenotype. And these proteins, some of the proteins are also known to be in the mitochondria. So, how, how uh, can you suggest how you correlate with the mitochondrial DNA damage? Uh, with the fission and fusion of mitochondria, or the mitochondrial dynamics. So I didn't understand the first part of your talk. There, so, there... so there are some proteins uh -huh. which, are, which are implicated when you have a mutation, point mutations in these proteins, they lead to ataxia type phenotype, I mean, like scan phenotype, like uh, there are several known. And <clears throat> they are also known to be in the mitochondria. So how mitochondrial DNA damage uh, is correlated with the dynamics of mitochondria? Oh, like fusion, damage. fusion, yeah. And how important it is in relation to neurodegeneration. Um, I mean, I think in general, you know, people who treat cells with drugs that cause an increase in oxidative stress, um, I think in those cases, well, in many cases you see mitochondrial fragmentation because of the damage. I think in depending on the cell system and other systems, you might find an increase in mitochondrial length because there's also this other system that works where uh, cause stress-induced hyperfusion where 
certain types of stress actually lead to an increase in mitochondrial fusion. So I guess it's, it's not clear to me, but usually an increase in oxidative stress is thought to increase you know, levels of mitochondrial mutations, and I think that certainly can lead to uh, degenerative defects. So I think we can continue this in the reception. Professor Chan will be available right afterwards in the library. And thank you again.